everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, brunch discussion on emerging issues in space technology and policy. Uh, for those of you I don't know, I'm Jamie Morin with the Center for Space Policy and Strategy at Aerospace. We're really delighted to have uh, so many folks come out and join us today. Today is an extraordinarily busy space day on Capitol Hill, as uh, many of you who are part of that extended community know, with uh, events all over the schedule today. So we appreciate folks joining us. We've got an exciting, and I would say jam-packed agenda today filled with uh, filled with panels and discussion on some of the really hot issues in space technology. But I uh, wanted to uh, begin by offering the podium to one of Aerospace's uh, home state congressman, Congressman Ted Lieu of California, who is has uh, taken a great interest in the work of Aerospace Corporation and our El Segundo headquarters outside of uh, Los Angeles. So we are delighted to have the congressman here. He is a uh, strong supporter of the aerospace industry, of one of the founders of the California Aerospace Caucus, for example. And he is also somebody I feel a little personal affinity for because he's had a significant uh, career as a military lawyer with the US Air Force. And as those of you who know me, I had some very formative years working with the Air Force and enjoyed pretty much every day of that, including the days spent working with space issues. So if I can, uh, Congressman, we're really grateful to have you here with us today. Good morning. Let me just say how excited I am to be in front of a lot of people who actually deal with facts. So thank you for being here. And thank you to the Aerospace Corporation for your leadership in space. Uh, before I came to Congress, I was in the California State Legislature, and I was chair of the Aerospace Select Committee. And my interest in space is not only do I think it's super cool, but I also understand it's one of America's competitive advantages. We have a competitive advantage in terms of our ability to do space. We also have a competitive advantage in terms of its ability to uh, create lots of jobs and to help different industries. We're not going to succeed in America making t-shirts. It's going to be in those industries where we uh, can do well, such as uh, high tech and biotech, the entertainment sector, agriculture, and aerospace and space is one of those industries. So that's why I also formed with Representative Ken Kelber, the California Aerospace Caucus, uh, to promote uh, this industry and make sure we continue to be the leader uh, in space. And as all of you know, in terms of the civilian side, the commercial sector, space plays a massive role. If GPS were to go down today, a lot of banking transactions would stop. And we would have an inability to navigate. It would really shut down the global economy. I just did reserve duty earlier this week at the Space and Missile Systems Center at Los Angeles Air Force Base. That's where uh, I am stationed uh, as a colonel. That's where I do my reserve duty. And that's also where uh, GPS helped to get developed back in the day. And even now, they're working on advanced other forms of GPS and so on. But it's very important uh, that we're, in terms of doing these military projects that eventually can also transition them to civilian applications like GPS, because that also helps society. But one thing I learned that's interesting uh, is we've always known in military that eventually space uh, is going to be a war fighting domain. And we're there now. Uh, the Air Force views it as a war fighting domain. Uh, it is something that we have to do in terms of protecting our own assets in terms of protecting our own satellites, both commercial and military. It's also going to be an area where we have to keep ahead of other competitors like China and other countries that are rapidly catching up in terms of space capability. And then we just need to articulate policies of how we're going to deal with this as we now start thinking about space as being a domain that we're going to fight. And uh, hopefully, uh, we can keep it peaceful, but if other countries are going to start taking actions that threaten uh, our satellites and our space dominance, then we're going to have to react. I know that people in the Air Force think about what would happen if there were a, a space type of 9-11 that were to happen. And so it's something that I hope all of you uh, think about, because a lot of our satellites up there are quite vulnerable. And think about what would happen, uh, not just in America, but to really much of the civilized world if these satellites uh, started uh, to go down. Um, I'd also like to uh, talk about, uh, very excited about uh, the 
mission to Mars. Uh, Dr. Sandy was going to go to the moon first, even though we've done it 40 some years ago, we're going to do it again. Uh, and then eventually uh, go to Mars. And I'm sure all of you have seen uh, Elon Musk's quote about Mars, uh, which is that he said, I don't mind dying on Mars, just not on impact. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the problem right now is not that we can't get human beings to Mars. It's how do we get them there and then bring them back. And, uh, that is a, a big problem. I know lots of smart folks are working on that issue. And let me also talk a little bit about something I think we need all of you to, to focus on, which is cybersecurity, especially as it applies to space. So I'm one of four recovering computer science majors in uh, Congress. <laughs> and we don't do cybersecurity well uh, in the civilian sector. We do a little better uh, military, but there's not a lot of articulation of cybersecurity in space. And what happens if one of these satellites gets hacked, and how do we make sure we have appropriate defenses, and also offensive capability to try to do this to other countries that may do it to us. So I think we need to start thinking about uh, how we can approach that issue and have policies and resources dealing with cybersecurity in space. And then we're going to have to deal also with artificial intelligence. I'm part of the, of the AI caucus, and eventually we're going to have, because it's just much more efficient, artificial intelligence do a lot of the controlling of our space assets and, and reacting to things that happen. I had this uh, uh, amazing opportunity to visit DARPA last year, as you know, it's a Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And some of you may have seen those Terminator movies. And I remember they were showing me these projects. This is all unclassified, by the way. Uh, one of them was this uh, automated drone system <coughs> so that when they got you know, different, whether it's a signal from space or from other things I was sensing, it would automatically deploy these defensive drones. And I just thought, ha, ah, that's the beginning of Skynet. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to see artificial intelligence becoming more and more prevalent, not just in land-based functions, but also in space-based functions. Uh, so with that, I am uh, happy to uh, take any questions that you may have. And once again, thank you uh, for Aerospace Corporation. By the way, real quick, a little bit over my district. Um, it's in Southern California. It goes from Malibu south through uh, Santa Monica, Manhattan Beach, Palos Verdes along the coast. In the middle, it gets West LA, Beverly Hills, Bel Air. So I have uh, the least angry district in America. Uh, <laughs> but also, uh, we've got enormous aerospace assets there. I hope you come and visit. We also have uh, an accelerator, Starburst, Starburst, which is designed to be an accelerator for aerospace <coughs> startups. So with that, thank you for inviting me here and happy to answer a, a few questions if anyone has any. also launching their own satellites, some of which can have pretty awesome capabilities to, to spy on the U.S., for example. So those are just some of the things that we'll be looking at. Well, thank you Great. very thank much. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, appreciate it. Sure, absolutely. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that could conclude our panel today. We <laughs> covered emerging issues in space technology and policy. Thank you uh, for your always being such a great host for us. Sir. Speaking of great hosting, I did also want to extend a special thanks to the uh, chairman and staff of the House Science Committee who, who were gracious enough to accommodate us in their hearing room. Um, I suppose I should say something like open the hearing room doors, but <laughs> uh, based on our AI. The, we have a we have two panels today, and I'm, I want to get to them very quickly. We're going to have a panel focused on launch, and we're going to have a panel focused on space situational awareness and space traffic management. 
these are two areas of emerging space technology and policy that are really pretty exciting and where uh, Congress has had an enormous level of interest, and that's why we're highlighting these two. But I wanted to make clear, this is, there is much more than just these two topics going on in space technology and policy today. And we believe uh, that today's conversation is one of many of them conversations that we need to have that is well informed by the science, by the technology, by the economics, and by the policy uh, that are all coming together in a dynamic space environment. I have just a couple <coughs> slides I wanted to display briefly to sort of set the scenes beyond launch and space traffic management. Uh, we know there is a great deal of change underway right now in the regulatory and policy environment for space. Uh, still in early days, but a succession of announcements have been made. We recently, last, uh, just late last month, saw the release of the second administration's space policy directive, which set out some broad general objectives for how the administration is going to approach regulations related to commercial space. Um, you see them up there. They addressed a series of specific topics, some, some very hot ones, but they also very consciously left a whole series of topics unaddressed, some of which we expect will be addressed later this summer and into the fall, but others of which I think require continued engagement and involvement. This is just a listing of some of them, and again, I expect several of these will come up in the context of today's discussion, and then also in upcoming meetings of the National Space Council and other, other events and decisions. But important steps being taken to adapt to the changes that have been going on for the last decade or more in the space world, many of which have to do with core technological and economic changes that are enabling business models that were hard to conceive of a decade or two ago. Uh, we try to conceptualize at the Center for Space Policy and Strategy the art of the possible in space as reflecting the intersection between that which is technically feasible, this is an area that Aerospace Corporation spends a lot of time working on, both understanding and advancing the art of the technically possible, but also that which is economically viable from a business model perspective or from a government willingness to devote resources, and then a policy acceptable acceptability threshold. And all three of those are in constant motion right now. They're adapting and they're changing one another. Technology is advancing, it's advancing in part because we're making conscious decisions to invest. And this complex interplay is really a difficult place for policymakers to operate, including legislative branch. So we're, we're, we're focused on trying through events like this to help people think their way through it from a non-advocate perspective, because as many of you know, aerospace is a federally funded research and development center. We run a federally funded research and development center, which means we're chartered in the public interest, we're nonprofit, and we're not in the business of selling anything. Some of our good colleagues here are, and that's a wonderful thing, um, we like to bring together people who have a variety of interests and equities in order to have a, a forthright conversation so that we can get to better informed policy without pushing specific solutions. So that's a context overview. We're going to drill down today on two specific topics, STM and um, launch, in reverse order. But fundamentally, in both areas, we are dealing with a contrast between different concepts of government's role in space. We know that from an international legal and domestic legal perspective, um, government has a preeminent role in space, right? Space activities must be licensed by, by the nation that's, who's, who's responsible for them, whether they're commercial or not. Um, the Outer Space Treaty has been clear on that for a couple generations now. The government's role will not go away. The traditional model of a um, tug of war that you saw between regulator and regulated is really not often the right way to think about space. We have national interests in being competitive, as you heard the congressman say, and more often than not, it's a symbiotic relationship that we can foster as opposed to a confliction war. So I hope we'll hear quite a bit about that today. I want to start by introducing our first panel, which is moderated by uh, Major General Retired Ed Holton, a senior member of the aerospace team, our senior vice president for defense systems group. Uh, General Bolton uh, is a, spent a long career in the Air Force, including some really important roles in space launch, and also uh, a role where I got to know him when he was working on budget issues. So he understands the, the fiscal piece of this as well. He went on to work with the FAA and the Department of Energy in senior executive roles, and has been with aerospace for a few years now leading our interface with the senior levels of the department. 
Department of Defense. General Bolton, can you uh, do the honors with your panel, and I will hand the uh, microphone over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good morning. How are you all doing? Good morning. Um, all right, so I'm going to start. I'm going to forego opening comments because uh, probably what's my about. You can spend a whole time talking about my bio and whatever else. We only have 50 minutes here, and I really want to, you know, I feel like Steve Kerr today. I have three superstars. I'll give this a little off the ball. I have two questions. Raise your hand if you're a congressional staff. Please raise your hand. I just want to see who we have here. All right, congressional staff here, anyone just, just seeing? All right. Uh, I want to firstly uh, shout out and thanks to the congressional staff. Uh, part of the reason we do this is that we really want to partner with you. And uh, having worked with people like you a generation ago, uh, on and off, we know how hard you work uh, for not a whole great deal of remuneration. Uh, and so we appreciate you being here. Thanks for being here. So let's start off with the panel. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm like Steve Kerr today. So I'm starting off here with a uh, longtime friend and attorney brother, uh, Mr. Kelvin, Col Kelvin Coleman. He's the, at the FAA, he's the Acting Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation. Uh, he spent 20, actually 21 years at the FAA. Uh, when we first met, you were the special assistant to the, uh, to the Associate Administrator of the Mr. Tagri Smith. He had many important jobs in between. Uh, he has a, a bachelor's in WE from George Mason, an MBA uh, from uh, Miramount, uh, and we're delighted to have you here. And again, uh, hello. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> How many people here are <laughs> in, 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 the, in, in the back? Did you hear anything what I said at all in the back? Did you say, hear anything what I said? Did, did you get my Steve Kerr joke? That's, that's a, last night's your last shot at that. Uh, uh, well, but, uh, you know, you can't exaggerate if you said this person literally has a ton of things on his shoulders, and I'm really thankful for what you had going on. Uh, emails at midnight last night, you can hear today. Uh, next to him is uh, is our A-Rod, uh, you know, uh, and, and I, I didn't, you know, I know we, we all know who A-Rod is, but I, I gotta tell you, I was so impressed that when I read his bio, I didn't really, I didn't know the depth of his expertise until I read his bio. He's currently, uh, the Vice President for Government and External Relations at uh, Vector Launch, which has international, national, state, and local interests. Uh, and they are a disruptive organization that is focusing on putting small sats in Leo. Uh, educationally, he has a master's in public policy from Harvard. Uh, he has a, a poli-sci degree from, uh, from Arizona. Uh, he's a distinguished alumni from uh, one, of the, one of the schools in New Mexico. I am a local, so I love that. Uh -huh. And, uh, and just, uh, just uh, one of the great uh, uh, intellectual leaders of, of, uh, of the commercial industry. And also, uh, he, I didn't know that you were a captain in the Army and deployed, and uh, you know, so just a tremendous background. I'm hoping he's gonna share uh, just some of that with us. We just don't have enough time. And uh, the final star, now I don't know, are you Kevin or are you, are you Steve? I don't know if I'm sure you. So, so Sam Sims is, is uh, part of our Albuquerque team. Uh, at, at Aerospace, and she's an engineer working in the Space Innovation Directorate, and her goal is she is the lead architect for putting cutting-edge technology into the space test program. Uh, and so her ability to do prototypes and multi-mission, she has really 20 years of, of experience in launching uh, multi-mission assets. She also has a, a, she a, a BS in uh, materials, I believe, uh, from New Mexico Institute of Science of, uh, of Mining and Technology, a master's in material science and engineering from Vanderbilt University. She's a pioneer in STEM. Uh, you really, we could go on and on with just the introductions. So, uh, uh, thanks, Sam, Alex, Kelvin. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, I have some questions, but again, if you have questions, throw them out. Uh, let's let's cause a ruckus here. Let's get some stuff done. Uh, you know, this this is. Uh, I, I, I will say this as an as an open, as an open comment. Uh, so I, I, I'm old enough uh, to, to have been alive, but I don't remember uh, Sputnik. I certainly uh, remember watching Americans uh, land on the moon, and uh, and I was a major at the headquarters. We went through a very serious uh, uh, spat of uh, launch failures, which almost put us out of space business. And I will say, uh, those three times, this is the f I would add this is the fourth. This is the biggest time of change in the space injury, uh, industry outside of maybe those four, maybe, uh, that, we've, that we've had uh, uh, in, the, in the 61 years of space. You all agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, with the rapid commercialization and democratization of space, 
uh, with determining uh, what the policy and regulations are going to be. There's just so much going on, and I said it would make an opening statement. So I will say to you, <laughs> it's just, I'm just excited. It's just good stuff. Uh, one of the most pressing obstacles in policy, regulation, and law that would need to be addressed in supporting an accelerated and sustained launch uh, cadence. Sir, let's we'll start with you. Well, first of all, good morning. Can, can everyone, everyone hear me? Okay. That's why I'm not. I'll try to talk loud. There you go. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> that works. So first of all, I want to thank the Aerospace Corporation uh, for hosting these panels. These are very important uh, issues that we're discussing. I will also thank uh, General Bolton. As he mentioned, we go back a ways, um, about 20 years. Thank you, sir. And uh, I, I, too, want to thank you for your service. And uh, former FAA alum, Ed taught us a lot in the FAA about uh, space transportation. It was great to have, uh, outside of my office, op voices within the Federal Aviation Administration who really understood space. And Ed was one of those voices for many years uh, in the FAA. So I want to really thank you for uh, those contributions. Uh, we live in exciting times now, and uh, having been uh, at this for about 21 years and watching this grass grow, uh, for the last couple of years, we've seen unprecedented growth, uh, really exciting change in the industry. Uh, we're uh, in, embarking upon a fourth uh, industrial revolution right now. Commercial space is very much a part of that, leveraging a lot of what we're seeing. And as a government regulator, our job is to be agile, adaptable, and to enable this innovation to take place. Uh, it, it creates American jobs, opportunities, uh, enhances uh, our lives as Americans. And so as a government regulator, and, and the administration has really uh, latched onto this and really focused on this, is we want to streamline our regulations to enable this innovation and these, uh, this growth to take place. And so that's what we're hard at work doing. Space Policy Directive 2, which was signed with the President on, on, on May 24th, uh, directs uh, the Secretary of Transportation to do, do just that, streamline our launch and re-entry regulations, and we're hard at work uh, doing that right now. We're working very closely with uh, academia, industry, uh, our government partners uh, to, to, to do that, to do that just that. And uh, we're making significant progress. For us, this is, um, I mean, again, I talked about being adaptable. Uh, this is a significant shift for us as a, a government regulator. Uh, regulations typically take anywhere between three to five years uh, to, to, to work. And we're doing this particular regulation in a significantly shortened time period. We're looking at having a notice of proposed rulemaking on the streets by February 1st of next year. Again, pretty quick, pretty fast for us, but we have to be adaptable. We have to meet the challenges that the industry presents to us. And so in that vein, we've outlined three uh, primary areas of focus within the Office of Commercial Space Transportation. One, we've already talked about regulatory streamlining. That's our first priority. Secondly, we want to keep pace with industry. So as we see uh, increased demand for our, our, our products and services, licenses, permits, safety approvals, uh, we have a statutory uh, uh, time frame right now to issue licenses within 180 days, permits in 120 days. Well, those time frames are, are not typically meeting the demands of business. So we have to deliver those products and services a lot faster. So we're placing a big emphasis on keeping pace with business. Uh, and that means delivering our licenses and permits even faster and quicker. Uh, and then the last challenge is mass integration. So as we see commercial spaceports uh, popping up in different places around the country, we see increased launch activity. Uh, we have to figure out smart ways to integrate commercial space transportation operations into the national aerospace system. So we place a, a, a big priority on that as well. We work hard with our partners within the FAA and the airlines to ensure that commercial space transportation has equitable access and <coughs> balanced access into the national aerospace system. So those are some of the priorities for us and some of the challenges that we're trying to meet. That's a, that's a great start. That's a great start. Uh, let, let me go to A Rod next. If, if you can, you all can you can can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me in the back? Do you need a <coughs> Okay. All right. Uh, so, so let's go to A Rod. So I, I'm very I'm very interesting uh, in this uh, in this transformation as we're focused on uh, much of the space is going to be commercial, right? If you look at the if you look at the launch tempo for the launch bases that's projected about five years. We expect to have about 120 launches. If you look at everybody who has who's put plans in place, if that, all, if that all actually happens. So what do you see as the most pressing challenges to get to the kind of launch rates that we need to, to do what we need to do uh, from a commercial perspective? 
Sure, uh, General. Uh, first of all, thank you for your service to our nation. Um, and uh, we, we definitely have a couple points uh, to share uh, specifically. <coughs> first of all, uh, I want to say thank you to the Center for Space Policy, uh, the Aerospace Corporation, for this exciting uh, forum on emerging issues in space technology and policy. It certainly uh, will impact uh, the American economy, as uh, the Congressman said earlier. Uh, it's a privilege for Vector to be with all of you this morning. We appreciate your time uh, very much. Uh, and also a shout out to other private sector companies that are in the room here. Uh, we appreciate uh, the, the vibrancy of the ecosystem. Uh, just a, a tad bit about Vector for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, Vector Launch Incorporated um, uh, started uh, just over two years ago with a very simple mission uh, to send microsatellites into orbit. Uh, into uh, low Earth orbit in particular. Uh, so we are an access to space company uh, that's positioned to uh, really help capitalize uh, what is being forecasted as a trillion dollar economy in the out years. Uh, as some of you are aware, in 2017, the uh, space value chain, the global e economy for space uh, was at about $345 billion. And uh, so it's mushrooming out in the out years. That's an opportunity for all of us. Uh, if you look at it from a global perspective, uh, it's about America taking uh, a greater market share of that trillion dollar forecast. Uh, so we're very, very excited about that. Uh, our company is uh, headquartered in Tucson, Arizona. We have facilities in California uh, as well. And uh, so we're focused on launching uh, up to 150 kilograms to orbit. Uh, we are, think about the, the rocket as one of the, actually we believe it's the smallest rocket in the commercial market today. Uh, our Vector Rapid vehicle will send uh, 65 kilograms uh, to low Earth orbit. Uh, we have a second vehicle, our Vector Heavy vehicle, uh, will launch 150 kilograms into low Earth orbit. So we're targeting the niche market, the, the low end of the spectrum, if you will, capitalizing on what's already been said here. Uh, the trends and market drivers in terms of miniaturization, uh, removing cost out of the equation, both for satellite hardware as well as for the launch business itself. Uh, so it's a big challenge, uh, but we certainly are up to it. Um, there's growing market demand, as you all know, out there. And uh, one of the unique features uh, about the cadence that we anticipate is uh, being able to have a rapid launch rate, a rapid uh, capacity to be able to <laughs> fill that demand. Uh, for example, last year in 2017, we know, we know that there were satellites that could have been, should have been, but did not get into orbit. And that's a fundamental problem. Uh, they uh, didn't have uh, the, the, the access that they needed when they needed. So uh, we are uh, attempting to disrupt the launch market to fulfill the transformation and the disruption happening in the satellite sector in the first place. Uh, and of course, that's the enabler, uh, General, to all the other industry sectors. So I do want to get to your two points uh, it, um, it, that, uh, that can help, uh, certainly in working with our, our partners and colleagues from the FAA. Uh, we are very honored to uh, be with Mr. Coleman today. Uh, our team has been working effectively uh, day and night uh, virtually for, for the last few months uh, for our first uh, license uh, to, uh, to be able to launch successfully into orbit. Uh, so I'll pause there, but uh, I can't tell you how excited uh, we are to see a, a real unique convergence, a convergence of action and leadership coming out of this very room, uh, leadership from our members of Congress leadership from the agencies, uh, FAA, AST, uh, making necessary adjustments and steps to uh, really beat that 180 day uh, timeline that they have. And uh, Calvin, I'm ecstatic to hear that by the way, because uh, that's certainly what would keep pace with us in the out years is a uh, launch, uh, a launch cadence that would be uh, multiple times, even a, a week. Uh, so, Overall, we have a unique opportunity, as I uh, indicated before, it's a once in a generation moment to really leverage technology, this convergence, and risk capital 
coming to the table to uh, make uh, companies like ours viable in the first place. So, so that's helpful, and I think I want to go with that protocol. I think uh, given the uh, what these guests have to offer, maybe I'll come to you, Sam, and say, if you want to have some open comments you want to make, uh, yeah, I, I have a question, but you don't have to address the open comments. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, obviously, it's part of part of our team. Uh, I, I would be, I think, it'd be very interesting to understand what you have done in the space test program to solve some of the problems uh, that they they have not solved in getting things up, processed, and launched rapidly. But I would defer to any opening comments you want to make on any topic. All right, is this on? Yeah. I hope so. Not <laughs> <that much. laughs> um, so, like Ed said, I have been with aerospace for over 20 years. Um, all of it has been in Albuquerque, supporting the DoD space test program. That program is the DOD's office to get space R&D payloads access to space. And we very rarely fly one spacecraft on one launch vehicle. It is almost always multiple spacecraft coming from multiple different organizations. Um, if you haven't had a chance to see the poster over there for STP-2, that's our mission, hopefully launching at the end of this year on a Falcon Heavy. It has 23 spacecraft coming from 12 different organizations, including a foreign government. And just having to figure out, one, what does e where does each spacecraft have to go for all of their policy and regulation approvals? What do they have to get done? Sometimes we have instances where you have DOD payloads on a commercial satellite or, or DOD payloads on a NASA satellite. We have a, two university satellites. You know, Trying to figure out, navigate the policy roadmap, it's very hard to figure out who needs what and where they have to go. And then additionally, we tend to have timelines that are very short. From start to finish, in three years, we'll get something launched. And it, it is hard to figure out what you need to get done and get it all done before launch. Um, and Whenever we start a mission, I always tell people, start all your regulatory and policy stuff ASAP, because you may think the technical stuff is the hard and the long pull stuff, but it's not. The paperwork is all of the long and hard stuff. <laughs> and I, was, I was very glad to hear everything you said. <laughs> Do you want an opportunity about that, or, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Cohen? <laughs> and are there any burning questions in the audience? Is there someone said, sir? This does go to the space test issue. Gordon Ressler, uh, formerly of DARPA, just retired a month ago. And we have, we have worked together on, on the space test launch. There will be one that way, if not 20 years ago, a very large spacecraft with robot arms on it. Well, uh, what I've observed is that the space test program's budget has gone down and down and down over the years. Uh, we, we, we talk about wanting America to retain its preeminence in space. This is not the right way to do that. Uh, and I would also raise the question, and of course, it is an opportunity for the small launch vehicle creators, the people that are, that are just showing up on the scene, to, to get more things up there. Because the industry, need, the industry needs to fly these things and make sure they work. But the, the, the policy and the, and the processes to do this are not yet clear. So two questions. One of them is about supporting an increase in the DOD space test program budget. And let's remember that the primary uh, requirement for getting an upcheck there is national security application, but it's not necessarily commercial application. So commercial hardware for commercial purposes doesn't, doesn't do well with the space test program. And the same question is, what about starting a commercial analog to the DOD? space test program, something to specifically to help industry get its needs met for things like advanced communication systems and advanced systems. Do you have any questions for this panel? <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's about launch, right? Because but, but what would support this growing launch industry would be these two programs that yeah. feed things to the launcher. Sure, more money on I'm in. <laughs> and I will say, STP last year yeah. did get a congressional plus up for $15 million specifically to go out and purchase venture class launch vehicles. Yeah, I, I think those are great ideas. Uh, it'd be hard to argue against that. Uh, the, the other people have burning questions. Uh, sir. Uh, this is for Mr. Coleman. 
Sorry. Um, I was for, just thinking about it. Sure. For Mr. Coleman, you talk about um, really the timeline for getting to the final regulation process through two to three year process, and you're trying to streamline that. Do you find um, in the, the burning need to be able to uh, facilitate innovation while also responding to necessary you know, administrative procedure act requirements, are existing regulatory processes outlined in the APA, um, are they able and flexible enough to get you what you need to get to faster launch, faster permits, or do we need to be conceiving of a new administrative state in terms of how we move towards facilitating innovation? Yeah, I, mean, I think that we've been able to work within the current construct of the APA uh, to, to meet the challenges that we're now facing. So I think we're, we're, we're good to go in that area. I wouldn't suggest we need to change the APA right now. Uh, but we are significantly challenged, and again, we've been able to work within that construct to, to meet our challenges. Thank you. Jim? Yeah, it's Jim Armour, but. I think you're launching out of both uh, Mars and Camden, and can you compare and contrast the uh, you know, policy at the state and federal level between those two and how it's going, and second, if you're looking for overseas launch? Okay. So um, we'd be happy to discuss that. Um, Vector's approach to launch is very simple. We want to ensure our customers' customers' success. And that's where it all really should fundamentally begin, right, is from, from the user upwards. In other words, we tend to look at it just from the launch or, or the spaceport. Our company, I'll tell you, is incredibly focused on the outcomes of the data. As you know, there's massive and growing demand for data around the world. Uh, think about this, for example, over 3 billion people are not connected yet. Uh, so that's a fundamental opportunity and, uh, and, and, and certainly for the microsatellite community and, uh, and LEO uh, presents uh, a significant market, um, uh, uh, market challenge. So how to do this as efficient and as effective and as reliable and cost effective is what our focus is. This brings us to your question, Jim, uh, spaceports. Clearly, we're looking at all the, the national spaceports in the United States. Uh, Vector is an American company. Uh, we were founded here. We're focused on launching uh, initially out of the United States. Uh, we're looking at, uh, for example, uh, the Cape and Kodiak and Wallops, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, Camden County, Georgia. Uh, is attempting to be the first uh, non-commercial spaceport of its kind. Uh, they're close to getting their operator license and working with the FAA uh, through the uh, EIS uh, uh, process. And so from our perspective, um, we, we start with the customer requirement in mind. What's the inclination? What is the purpose of the launch? What are the requirements? And let's go fulfill those. Uh, when you have that clear, then it makes sense to focus on the particular spaceport uh, that's going to be uh, the most advantageous for that mission, uh, unique mission. Uh, so, uh, you know, we see a unique advantages for each of the spaceports based on their uh, location, their unique attributes. There's definitely some distinctions uh, among the spaceports themselves. Uh, but uh, uh, fortunately, we have options as well, and we're working hard to uh, establish strong re uh, partner relationships with all the spaceports here in the United States. Courtney. Uh, Courtney Stan with Vector Launch. Um, for Kelvin and Rapsi and Sam, the DARPA, to my former yeah. colleagues, just announced the, the DARPA challenge. And Kelvin, I wonder to what extent you can say anything about the interaction with DARPA, because our understanding. Remind us what the DARPA challenge DARPA is. challenge, uh, DARPA launch challenge, thank you, thank you. Uh, is uh, meant, in a sense, to take a company like a Vector and the other emerging uh, <laughs> space, uh, small launch companies and uh, put us to the test in terms of the type of tempo that, uh, that Alex was talking about. Obviously, that's a bit of a stress test back to Kelvin uh, and his team. Thus, I'm asking you the question, how you all reacting, interacting with DARPA because of that challenge. Just, I'm just curious whether, uh, from a 
payload standpoint, we're going to be looking at the, the DARPA challenge as well. Okay. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for that question. Yes, sir. Yeah, we've been working closely with DARPA on this. I mean, as you mentioned, this is a stress test yeah. uh, for our processes. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, there are a number of companies that have expressed interest uh, in the challenge, um, and uh, uh, we're in pre application consultation with a number of those companies. Um, given the, uh, the uh, parameters of the, of the contest, it'll challenge us in terms of how efficiently we can, we can issue licenses and permits and things that will be needed to enable those activities. Uh, but we have a great partnership with DARPA. Uh, we're working through it well right now. Um, and hopefully we'll find out some new innovative ways to do things that will enable the future that we're talking about here. So, so we're eyes and ears open, uh, and maybe there'll be some learning on our part in terms of what we can do to be more efficient uh, and more expeditious coming forward in the future. But we're working very closely with DARPA trying to make that work. Thank you. So currently, um, I'm not aware that we're working with DARPA on the launch challenge. However, if DARPA selects a launch vehicle and would like to fly payloads on it, STP always has payloads that can never arrive. And if the <laughs> price is free, that's even yeah. better. Um, and the nature of the payloads we fly, they are a higher risk tolerance. So we are often the first payloads on new launch vehicles. Um, we were on the first Pegasus, we were on the first Falcon um, 1s. Um, and we're on the first Falcon Heavy for the Department of Defense. Um, we do work with DARPA in, from the payload standpoint. DARPA has a seat on the Space Experiments Review Board and then can bring payloads forwards. Uh, we launched for DARPA the Orbital Express mission a few years ago. We are currently working with DARPA to launch in the future their RSGS robotic payload. If I might add to Please. that, uh, General uh, Bolton, uh, uh, Vector's heritage really goes back uh, uh, almost 20 years of launching small, uh, smaller vehicles, uh, test vehicles, suborbit vehicles, sounding vehicles, uh, and uh, working in conjunction with DARPA uh, to be able to test and, and really push the envelope. That fundamentally, that legacy and knowledge is what has come into Vector and become the basis of the Vector Rapid Vehicle. And so uh, from our perspective, we truly are excited uh, for the DARPA challenge. Uh, it's a challenge to all, the, all of us uh, to fundamentally move from where we're currently at to a possible future where you have multiple challenges from multiple locations in a matter of, of weeks, even in the same week. Uh, so uh, it's uh, really uh, gratifying to hear the, the consultation and the close relationship uh, that the FAA AST has formed and is working on with, with particularly with the DARPA challenge. Uh, it's, uh, it's an exciting time, frankly, and, and we commend the, the DARPA leadership for making it happen. I, I guess, Alex, I, I would come back to you. Uh, first of all, these comments have been very helpful. I, I, I certainly, so if you think about the future uh, of, a, of a significantly uh, advanced uh, launch rate, uh, I'm hearing multi-mission. Uh, I'm hearing uh, multi-location. Uh, I'm hearing uh, there are some policy answers. Uh, um, I certainly have a view uh, that there's going to be some that there's going to be some give on the on the payload side because if you really look at what it takes to go launch now, uh, you lock down the range for days, right? Uh, to do to do the checks for your instrumentation. Some of that's driven by safety. Some of that's driven by the requirements of the payload. Uh, for telemetry and for, uh, for post-processing. And so I'm interested, uh, you know, from, from our commercial guru here, what is it you're most worried about? Uh, you know, what, what's, what's the thing that, do, that, you, that you feel we just need to break through to free you? Uh, you know, that's a fundamentally a great question. Um, I think Vector doesn't see it so much as a worry as an opportunity. Oh, uh, an opportunity to uh, be able to serve the microsatellite industry and their customer base. In order to achieve that, uh, yes, there are a couple things that, uh, from our perspective, can, can help achieve a stronger American space economy. Uh, one of those, for example, is a, a licensing that does uh, support a multi-launch environment. Think, for example, of a common destination, if you will, uh, where um, it, it, that particular mission set is for a common destination. The configuration does not change on the vehicle, and therefore you have a unique opportunity 
to uh, approve that that admission uh, set and uh, license <laughs> info. Correct. So based on yeah. on that one yes. destination, yes. as opposed to a, a single launch license for every <laughs> unique launch. Um, the, I think there is an opportunity there uh, to collaborate and work together again as as partners with FAA AST. A second and fundamental aspect uh, for Vector in particular, uh, probably for others as well, is um, the facilitation, um, uh, if you will, of accepting what's already a 21st century uh, technology. Uh, I'm talking about uh, automated flight safety systems. This is absolutely uh, essential uh, for us to be able to move forward faster. And uh, automated flight safety uh, has already been pioneered by NASA and by DARPA. It's currently fielded by SpaceX. Um, it's working, it's shown promise, and certainly Vector is interested in adopting, uh, you know, we talked about achievable solutions uh, at the beginning of the forum. Uh, well, that's one. Uh, that's one that's uh, reliable uh, and uh, it's, it's software-based. Uh, keeping in mind, uh, for everything that Vector does, we start with safety and end with safety. And so if you think about it, we're launching rockets, clearly there's a national security interest as well as a general public interest. Those are the sort of the two policy pillars uh, in, in the rocket business. And so we understand that. We understand that and support the need to achieve safety and obviously the need to assure uh, national security. Uh, so, so this multi-launch opportunity would be uh, a kind of a packaging idea, uh, Calvin, is, is something of interest to us, and, and the automated flight safety software that's already proven and reliable would be a, a game changer, frankly, uh, General. So, uh, I guess, Calvin, I'll take, I'll take this one. So, uh, so uh, Calvin and I, two days ago, spent three hours with uh, General Raymond, who's the commander of Space Command, uh, in which he... Uh, took a briefing on work a team had done to implement uh, uh, AFSS by 2023. Uh, and you would put it in three buckets. The answer for the commercial industry, yes. Uh, SpaceX, GLA, uh, Blue Origin, and uh, what was it? Uh, you know, uh, 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 yes, you guys. Yeah, <laughs> you guys. <laughs> I can, I can, on, it was called OTK that day. That day. That was two days ago. Answer <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for commercial is yes. Answer for government space lift uh, and that's SMC, NRO, and NASA is yes. Uh, long poem intent is the are, are the uh, OTN people, uh, uh, MDA, uh, the, the Navy, uh, and um, uh, one more. Oh, GDSC, uh, the, uh, the next uh, version of, of ICBMs. Uh, and so aerospace uh, volunteered. Uh, to take the task and put together a, a vision document uh, within 60 days to uh, transform, the, that would be a transformative range that would break through some of these problems. That would be AFSS and some of these larger, <coughs> some of these larger, larger things. But, uh, but AFSS is the plan that has a subset of transform, a transform range. Uh, the FAA is working a big piece of it with this uh, rulemaking that we're doing, which you spoke up in uh, his, his open comment. So I, so I think, uh, uh, there, there is some hope uh, that will be prepared uh, uh, by, and again, all the world, the test committee is going to be ready by 2023. The test committee will be ready to get the money. Well, General, let me just say that this is incredibly welcome news, and we're encouraged by it, and, and certainly appreciate both of you for your, your, your leadership in, in helping bring together uh, sort of a mix of uh, individuals with General Raymond. Um, again, this is uh, um, really a, a breakthrough opportunity I think so. to get to uh, so. the launch, for, particularly for the small class vehicle so. uh, I'd I like to go back to, and we can talk more on that, and we're happy to share, uh, you know, kind of our views on it. Once we can be get shaped up uh, in about 30 days. I'd like to go back to Alex, and I really would just love to hear, uh, you know, whatever you have off the top of your head. Um, there's tremendous success in the space tax program, and in uh, you know you know you can categorize uh, A, B, C, or D. Uh, and they usually often you see D uh, class uh, payloads. Uh, they've solved a lot of the problems uh, 
uh, at more extensive, heavier systems are still dealing with. What, what lessons learned from the space, in 20 years in the space, 21 years? Okay, now you said that was going to Alex, but did you mean it to me? I meant to you. I'm going to repay attention to your answer. Now you have to pay attention. Okay, Sam. <laughs> what lessons learned from small sat space test program, uh, from you know rapid integration, multi-mission, uh, three years, would you offer to the rest of the world? Um, it's similar to big space, just faster. We don't do things sloppy. We don't do but the things. How, how is it faster? Why? Why are you faster? Um, Better looking, smarter. <laughs> I think one of the things that uh, somebody told me when I first came into the program is, is we put together good teams, small, and, and management gets out of our way and lets oh. us execute. <laughs> And they just let us go, and they let us work it. And we know the rules, and we know the boxes we need to stay in, and we just go and work it. I think having a small team does help. Is um, the risk calculation different? I don't think so. I mean, we do, we have an agile mission insurance. Um, What's where, that? Where we come in and we look at it and we say, what are the things that have to be done? We only have this amount of budget or this amount of team man hours to spend on our mission assurance. We studied and we said, where are the places that we really need to go? Where are the high risk items on this particular mission that we need to throw all of our people at? Maybe there are some areas that we don't need to throw as much time and money at. Okay, okay. All right, do you want to comment on that, FAA? No, I think that's that covered. That's covered? Okay, all right, all right. All right, sir. Quick right. question. Um, based on what you were describing about the task you took on to re-architect the, the range of uh, system operation, uh, have you, are you including the insurance industry in that discussion? I think it would be a good opportunity. That's a great idea. To, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, especially for the commercial aspect of it. My answer is, uh, I haven't had, this is Wednesday. <laughs> so I don't have any. <laughs> so the answer is no, I haven't thought of it. Uh, and we will, we will. What else? Anyone else want to help me with our homework? Anyone else? Sir? Sure. Uh, I have a question for all of you. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, it's clear that the future of space is largely commercial. Um, it's a transition that's been happening for a long time. And to support this transition, the administration is taking uh, several uh, moves to uh, shift it over to the private sector, such as changing the role of space in the DOC, um, cutting off funding for the ISS in 2025, um, the list goes on and on. Um, there are critics to these changes um, within Congress, NASA, uh, and the industry that say that uh, although it's clearly shifting to uh, the private sector, a continued strong government backbone is essential to uh, not only our short-term interest in space and developing uh, this private sector, but also our long-term uh, interest in space. Um, you all have different hats that you wear um, and approach this from uh, a different perspective. What role would you like to see the government play in space in both the short-term and the long-term? Wow. That should have been the first question. <laughs> <laughs> I got my five minute warning, two and a half minutes ago. <laughs> that's a big one, so I apologize. So that's a big one. Uh, uh, well, we have one person here who's still employed by <laughs> the government. Uh, it, so that, that's an opinion. I mean, we, we, the, the answer is we don't. I mean, I can read my honest answer off the top of my head. Uh, we, we don't really know. Um, we, we certainly think of, uh, you know, if, uh, if you look at the, the major breakthroughs and success in space have largely been government uh, in, in, in my lifetime, my career. As my career winds up, we're transitioning to commercial. Uh, I remember when Elon Musk first said he was going to start a rocket company, we all thought he was crazy. And he still says, how, 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 do, you, how do you make a small for fortune in the launch industry? Start with a big one, right? <laughs> Uh, and so, and so, I think Elon is kind of a boundary spanner, and I think you also look at there's a I see a common denominator that these are Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson. So a lot of people are writing checks right now, and I don't know when you get to that tipping point. Uh, I, I I don't know. Um, the other thing too, I think inherently government responsibility is safety, right? Uh, and so if you look at uh, you know you think, I think of my time as, as a range rat. Um, you know, we're the ones that make sure rockets get rain down on the uh, That so so. 
I, I think I think the real challenge is going to be um, if you don't know where you're going, the world will get you there. So I think you have to write down where you want to be at any point in time. Uh, once you've written down your end state and your vision, and you, you understand your values, uh, you know safety first, uh, you know national security second. Uh, and the commercial viability a uh, third, and that's me off the top of my head, but I, I'd, find, I would, I'd be willing to debate those. So you have a vision of an instant, you have values, then it makes this easy to make decisions in the near time frame, right? Uh, without knowing the end state, it's hard to really uh, differentiate between smart idea A and smart idea B, which is better. Uh, and, you know, for aerospace, we would like to partner with you in that process. Uh, we're available to write down views, uh, to pull in views that, again, what, 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 what the one that I agreed to do for John Raymond, we're going to draft that. That's going to go out to the various industry partners, so, including insurance. Uh, go out to the FAA, and we'll consolidate that in that. But you have to start, I believe, start with where you want to be. Uh, and then you figure out how to get there. And in the, in, in the time I have, that's, that's really all I can do. Let me, let me just let me just say uh, in conclusion. I'd like to thank uh, uh, um, Kevin, uh, Dreamon, and Steph uh, here uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and for the great panel. Uh, it was very very. Uh, Who's Steph? Who's Steph? Who's Steph? Who's Steph? Who's Steph? I want to thank the time. I, I found this very exciting. Uh, I found it very interesting. I think we, we did learn a few things. I did a bit of a wrap up. I did I do would say that uh, that fast is better. Uh, I think that there's no inherent uh, argument that it's more risk. Uh, I'd say multi mission, multi location uh, is better. And I would uh, also uh, argue that there was a policy component. And I think I think we came to your question is really instructive. I think we need to figure out where we want to be, uh, and then that, figure out what our priorities and values are. From that, you can determine what the appropriate government role is and really free, because frankly, I think the next wave of growth is going to be commercial. I get that. I, I totally get that. I'm totally with it. Uh, but, we're, but we're two launch failures away from all that going away. Right? Yeah, I remember six failures in 18 months. Uh, no one was talking about commercial. We're talking about can we get there at all. And so we need to be in a position so that when things, and there will be launch failures in the future, I promise you. We want to be in a position that our plan still looks good after we've had a couple of launch failures. Thank you all. Thank you all. Um, I will allow our chair of our second panel to introduce the individual panel members, but if I can say just briefly, uh, Ed Swallow is another colleague of mine from Aerospace. He's our senior vice president leading our civil and commercial systems group, so support to NASA, support to many of the civil agencies of U.S. government, including uh, Commerce and its uh, components. We, Ed has a very long and storied career in aerospace, uh, a whole variety of levels, major prime defense contractors, major civil space programs, small companies, and he also has been with aerospace for a few years now, leading our um, rapidly growing practice in support of NASA and the other civil agencies. Uh, he also is a, a former Air Force officer and Air Force Reservist with a distinguished career in that element of public service. So, uh, Ed, hope you can kick us off for a discussion of space situational awareness, space traffic management, and you have about 50 minutes. Uh, 43 minutes, sir. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, uh, I'm a firm believer and the moderator has uh, the, the 4B rule, be sincere, be brief, be seated, in between, be provocative. So I'm gonna try and go through this fairly quickly. Uh, you all remember the, the story about the dog that chases the mail truck? You know, and one day the dog actually catches it and you go, now what? Okay, this panel is all about, okay, you launched all this stuff, now what? So, in simple terms, we want to talk a little bit about space situational awareness, what's up there, what's it doing, uh, and space traffic management, how do we regulate what's going up there? You go back to the 1849 Oklahoma uh, land rush, uh, people got called Sooners because they did two things. They went out too soon, and they went out before the regulatory framework was in place uh, to decide how the land was going to be divided. And they just said, I'm going to go grab it anyway. And so you're not that anybody would launch a satellite without getting a license. <laughs> <laughs> 
But we're seeing things along those lines going on right now. Now you have big Leos coming into place who are wanting to establish their place at the at the optimum spot uh, in space for uh, getting direct to handheld and direct to home, and that's the 1,200 kilometer band. So space traffic management, the Oklahoma land rush is on, you know, for those space orbital slots. Uh, so we're here to talk a little bit about some of the things going on. Today we've got a great panel. Uh, their bios are online. I'm not going to read them to you. I assume everybody in here can read. Uh, and I assume most of you know how to go online. So uh, first up uh, is Earl Comstock. He's the director of, office, uh, of the Office of Policy and Strategic Planning at the U.S. Department of Commerce. In other words, uh, I believe uh, Secretary Ross refers to him as Mr. Uh, everything I need to have done, I'm going to give it to, to Earl. Uh, he has a, a long and distinguished career uh, United States Senate. Uh, but his primary responsibility is advising the Secretary of Commerce on policy matters and for executing the Secretary's initiatives. Uh, Earl Madison, uh, immediately uh, to his left, is Director of SATCOM and DOD Space on the Space and Missile Defense Programs Team at Lockheed Martin. Uh, uh, he's a former U.S. Army uh, officer. Thank you, sir, for your service. Uh, and he's very heavily involved in the Space Community Association uh, world. Uh, unfortunately, Rich Lesher, who was advertised to be here with us, has strep, uh, and given that most of us don't want to catch it from anybody, he decided that uh, passing was a, was a wise choice. Uh, last on our panel uh, from aerospace is Dr. Andrew Abraham. Uh, his area of expertise includes orbital debris, reentry analysis, flight safety, early orbit operations, conjunction assessment. I'm going to keep going on until I fully define space traffic management. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, but uh, he's, uh, he's here to kind of help us with the facts and data kind of questions that we know always come out of this kind of an audience. So with that, I want to transition and just kind of uh, ask the first question and get people started and give them a chance to make a few opening remarks in the context of that. Uh, Vice President Pence at the Space Symposium and a lot of other places, people have talked about, uh, but not yet addressed in a specific uh, uh, space policy directive, the space situational awareness and space traffic management. Do we think there's going to be uh, a space policy directive soon, and what should it address? Earl, no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for that nice introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here speaking to all of you. Uh, you know, obviously the Department of Commerce is very excited about taking on this new role. Uh, we have, for a long time, had a Office of Space Commerce, and obviously we do commercial road sensing, so we've got experience in that as well as operating a large constellation of satellites ourselves uh, with the help of a lot of our, our fellow agencies. So uh, this is an area that Secretary Ross is uh, very focused on. He's really looking forward to expanding the department's role. And as I think I outlined, you know, with people going ahead and staking things out, we want to get to um, the Homestead Act as quickly as we possibly can. So uh, we're this administration, I think, is putting an incredible amount of resources toward trying to really advance the ball. And, and our, our key goal, if you had to sum it up in, in a short phrase, for commercial space is to make sure that we're the flag of choice for companies going forward. Um, it's going to be critical, uh, not only for American uh, economic development, but for national security and other reasons, to really help uh, encourage and make sure that companies want to come here want to get licensed by the United States and want to uh, base their operations here before doing that. So uh, the Department of Commerce is very focused on making sure that we facilitate that and working within the intergovernmental process to streamline everything that we can, but also to try to start laying the groundwork for these new things. And to answer your question, uh, yes, there will be uh, another directive uh, that will come out at some point uh, when the Space Council approves it to look at this issue of SSA and STM, as well as uh, the science and tech related to that. So uh, it, it's a process that we are very focused on, and people are laying the foundation right now for trying to have a coherent regime on that. Great, thank you, Earl. I would echo that, uh, yes, there will be a policy. Vice President Spence uh, said that there would be. And uh, some of the things that I think we should consider are, are data sharing, conjunction assessments, uh, identification, uh, and, and the non-disruptive transition as the department uh, takes over. And we look forward to working with the department to make that a success. Great. Andrew. 
Um, yeah, just a couple comments on that. So, um, you know, Earl mentioned conjunction assessment and data sharing. I just wanted to give you a little more context behind that. So, you know, right now we have uh, some wonderful services provided by the, uh, the government, actually, um, by the uh, Department of Defense, um, that uh, share data to line element sets, okay? And this data, the thing about it is it's not the best data that is available, okay? There is data from the owner or operators of the satellites that is just kind of hitting the floor and not being dealt with. And so if we could obtain that much improved data and actually incorporate it into our conjunction screening processes, that would greatly enhance space flight safety. Great, thank you. Uh, you can hear me in the back. It, 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 uh, the longest words used to describe me, quiet has never shown up. Uh, so uh, what specific emerging technologies related to SSA data and analytics are needed to enable state operations in space? Uh, this was pointed out to me uh, uh, just about a week or so ago. When you're talking about air traffic management, airplanes have six, six degrees of freedom uh, in which to maneuver to avoid a, uh, uh, a conflict. They can go up, they can go down, they can go left, they can go right, they can go faster, they can go slow. So they have six degrees of freedom. In space, you only have two. I can go faster, which makes me go higher, or I can go slower, which makes me go lower. Left and right takes you out of plane, which is, from an energy perspective, not feasible. So you only have two degrees of freedom. That changes the technology necessary and the regulatory framework necessary to make it happen. So, what kind of emerging technologies are needed to make some of that stuff happen? I'll start down at that end. Sure. Well, there's a lot of different technologies that we could pursue to enhance that um, capability, but I'll just give you one of them since it's something I've been working on for the past year. So if you think about traffic management, right, we have in the aviation domain, we have these small little transponders. They're called ADSB, Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. In the maritime environment, we also have some transponders called AIS. They're even talking about putting transponders on UAVs and automobiles. So why don't we have these little transponders on space vehicles? Right. So this is something that I've been looking at um, for the past year. How do we develop such a system? How would we mature that system? How do you even develop a piece of technology that could facilitate that type of system? So imagine for a second that uh, we've actually been prototypes, <coughs> by the way get a little uh, device that's about the size of a deck of playing cards, okay? And that device would be attached to a space vehicle just prior to launch, all right? It collects GPS signals, stores them, has a small radio. It transmits those signals just like ADS-B would for an aircraft. It also transmits a serial number. And uh, it has some solar panels and a battery, okay? And so if the host spacecraft separates from the launch vehicle and dies, which, by the way, happens more frequently than we'd like, you still have custody of that spacecraft. And the GPS, that data that is provided, can get you an accuracy of about 10 meters, which is far better, an order of magnitude better than what we can obtain from the ground today. Okay, so, so that's just one technology that we're looking into. Great. I, I believe in, in addition to that technology, you have to look at this from an architectural perspective. There are a lot of pieces that have to come together to give you an SSA uh, picture and enable space traffic management. Those include uh, sensors, uh, those include the data provided by the sensors, the data collection, integration, and analysis, your catalog development and maintenance, change detection and analysis, conjunction assessments, warning development and dissemination, uh, communication links between all of these locations, all these sensors, and personnel that you're reporting to. The highly trained personnel to operate every portion of this, and then of course you've got to have the policy framework and, and the concept of operations to operate this. But I think you, you cannot look at one technology in isolation. I think you've got to take an architectural perspective and look at <coughs> how a new component, such as a transponder, fits into the overall uh, architecture to provide the space situational awareness and space traffic management that you need. Yeah, so I would, that's a great segue in because I was thinking, wow, we the, the lawyer on the panel sitting here, we probably shouldn't be talking about <coughs> technology issues. Um, but uh, the, uh, no, no, I mean, this is exactly why 
the administration is looking at how do you set up a regime for space traffic management. Obviously, we've got a wonderful set of sensors uh, operated by DOD that are providing the best information available. Could we improve it? Absolutely. And that's one of, the, one of the goals here is how do you take that private sector information, some of which DOD does already collect, um, and make better use of it. So that is, that's going to be one of the elements that the Department of Commerce will be focusing on is how do we set up that open architecture system that can take the DOD data, and take the take the private sector data, hopefully provide an integrated thing that both benefits uh, DOD in terms of maintaining the best catalog possible, and also makes it possible for operators to come here. That's hopefully one of the elements that will attract. And I want to touch on something else. Earl said he mentioned indemnity, you know, indemnification. Uh, the liability regime, for those of you who have some history and background in looking at particularly maritime world, it was actually the insurance industry that drove a lot of uh, maritime improvements. It led to all of the societies that classified vessels and, and set things up. There's no reason why we can't build on that kind of experience in space. And same thing with you know aviation. You obviously have a lot of work that's been done by the civil, civil aviation community in addressing some of these very same problems. So, what we're hoping to do is take that you know, past experience, integrate that, and you know, figure out how to deploy it. And, and another reason, you know, when people say why commerce, um, one of the one of the strengths we bring to this is we do have a number of individual components inside the department that provide a lot of expertise. So in addition to the work that NOAA is already doing in operating uh, weather satellites and looking at space weather, we have the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which brings a lot of specialized expertise that we can count on, and they've done a lot of work in areas of integrating things. And we also have NTIA, which uh, is the government spectrum manager, and so they're um, bringing that resource, because again, Earl mentioned the importance of being able to communicate across these constellations as they go, um, with, you know, provide information out on the ground, but also within space. So we're looking forward to this opportunity, but it is it is a great challenge, and uh, doing things like getting a small transponder on there picking up on what the aviation community learned over many, many long years of experience. We have to know where things are in order to really manage uh, this kind of environment. Great, thank you. Uh, at, at risk of being accused of pandering to my panel, uh, I'll, I'll ask the question, to start with Earl, uh, as the space fence comes online, uh, and uh, all of the data that's funded by the government plus private sensors uh, start providing more SS data, SSA data. How should all of that data be integrated together to benefit DOD <coughs> private operators and international operators? And what's what's the uh, the value proposition to the commercial develop uh, collectors of data for putting it into that repository? So I'll start with Earl. Right. Um, well, the, the, I'll start with the last question first. The value proposition that will have to be worked as as uh, the uh, space traffic management center is, is, is stood up. And that will certainly be a challenge. Uh, in doing that, and, and uh, I believe with Jigspot, the Air Force has gotten some experience in doing that, and there are some other organizations that have done that. Uh, consolidating this data is going to be very complex because you're going to have data from a lot of different uh, types of sensors, electro-optical, radar, transponders that are self-reporting, and, and other means, and this data is going to come from a variety of different sources, from the government, and that's DOD, Intel, and civil organizations, from commercial service providers, and possibly from private individuals, and private organizations that uh, do space observation. The data itself will come in a variety of classification levels. And even the unclassified data, some of that may be proprietary. So those are gonna be, all gonna be challenges to managing the data. As you bring on systems like Space Fence that you mentioned, uh, which is near and dear to my, my heart, uh, just uh, full disclosure, it's uh, one of the programs that I support. Uh, <laughs> hence my original risk. Of, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and I'll try not to make this a commercial. Uh, that again, uh, as I stated up front, has to, that data has to be integrated into the overall architecture. That's a challenge. And some of these newer systems are gonna bring in massive amounts of data that needs to be assessed for how precise it is, how accurate it is, how timely from whatever source that data comes from, consolidated and put into a usable form, often catalog, and then that data has to be used. Um, 
And as we go along, we're going to see that these sensors are, are going to be much more capable. Space Fence alone, uh, we just recently filled out the arrays on that. We're in the process of calibrating uh, the Space Fence. We'll turn it over to the Air Force at the end of the summer for uh, their technical testing and operational testing. But I've, I've seen estimates that the current catalog is approximately 17,000 uh, registered uh, space objects. And the Space Fence alone will grow that uh, catalog by uh, an order of 30,000. I've seen estimates as high as 200,000. So managing all that data is going to be a challenge. Yeah. So, Andrew, with yeah, with yeah. Guys. Just, just uh, one or two thoughts on that topic of space fence. Um, so, overall, it's great, right? We're we're getting to see a bunch of objects that exist in space already. It's just we really couldn't detect that they were there, right? Because uh, the thing about space fence is it can detect objects that are much, much smaller. And there happens to be a whole lot more small objects than there are large objects, right? So that being said, there are some challenges that come with that, right? And one of the challenges is for a large percentage of these objects that space fence detects, only space fence will be able to detect. And so if you're talking about data quality concerns, you know, every time that we take a measurement, there's always a little bit of uncertainty in that measurement, right? And so if you have something that's very small, that's kind of on the borderline of what space fence can detect, there could be a larger amount of uncertainty. So now you jump into a space flight safety situation where you're trying to see if two objects are going to collide in space, you want the least amount of uncertainty in the position of those objects as possible. Okay? And so, you know, do we have the right algorithms to deal with that? Um, how do we cope with that? That challenge is kind of an open-ended question. Okay, so Earl, I'll take that up one level, uh, given that you're not on the technical side. Commerce is talking about being the place for the repository for all this data and all that. That's going to present some interesting challenges for you. Well, it certainly will. Um, but I, I think the important thing to remember here is this is where you can lever both the private sector and the government side. Um, you know, can we do this today with weather data, for example? Uh, the National Weather Service has worked out quite a few things to share weather data, both with other meteorolo meteorological uh, organizations, but also with private sector entities that are interested in getting that data and then doing things with it. So this is an area where we're optimistic, frankly, that we can leverage the um, capabilities of the private sector to tackle some of this. You know, there's going to be a basic level that we need to make sure we have uh, available. As I said, the, the goal here is, is to make more information available to private operators, but also at the same time, get the benefit of that information and bring it back to the government. So that at the end of the day, DOD gets the benefit of, of this information and has that available. We get maximum benefit from the DOD information, and then hopefully we can utilize these private sector capabilities to constantly improve on these algorithms and these other capabilities. Obviously, we're going to be storing a lot of data and looking at a lot of things, but if you can let the private sector get in there and look at this data, there are very smart people out there who can help us figure out this is a problem we need to solve, this is how we can solve it, and in, in the process they'll probably be looking to make a little money, but that's fine. That's a, that's a great incentive to, uh, to get people motivated to get out there and fix a problem. Great, thank you. I'm going to have one more question and then I'm going to open it up to the floor. I uh, wanted, wanted to uh, give one that uh, Earl can start with, and that is, in this new administration, more emphasis has been placed on the Department of Commerce on space-related issues. What does the department need to be successful? Uh, well, fortunately, we've got uh, some nice support already on the Hill. Uh, in, in a recent mark, the, the House side has already bumped up the appropriation for the Department of Commerce. We're very thankful for that, and hopefully the Senate will follow soon uh, in, that, in that process. Um, but this is where the administration's interagency process, led by the National Space Council and Vice President Pence, with the full support of the President, is really important. Uh, we're getting a lot of support across the government you know, putting together a process, you know, maximizing the, the capabilities that departments already have. DOT is going to continue to launch and re-entry. They have the experience, the expertise, and they're going to do that. And Commerce is going to expand in the, into this STM, SSA area, trying to really leverage that, and like I said, become the repository so hopefully commercial entities can get to a one-stop shop scenario. It doesn't mean we're going to be doing all the work, but hopefully we can provide the entry point for people to come, into the government, 
and then we can help assist you get through the process. So whether it's a DOT license for launch or entry, or it's some other license that you need uh, through remote sensing or, or some other aspect of the government, we'll be there to facilitate it. Uh, and we're also obviously supported by the department. In addition to the great work defense is doing, you know, state does a lot of work with the inter international agencies as well. So and this is a whole of government effort, and that's what's, uh, I think, really made Secretary Ross excited about it, is to see just how strongly under, under Vice President Pence's leadership, the Space Council has gotten there, and the President has really given the direction to the, to the Council to make this happen, you know, to see this become a real reality. So, so we have the support, the Congress comes along, and uh, you know, so far our conversations with them have been going very well, and we really appreciate the support from the Hill for making this happen. Great, Earl. From looking from the outside, great. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to argue with the uh, Department of Commerce. Uh, you know, we look forward to to work with them. I mentioned an architectural perspective in uh, working these issues, and we have expertise in a number of those areas. Uh, some of our competitors have uh, expertise in others. We look forward to uh, competing and, and working with you to uh, solve uh, these challenges that we have. Andrew, what do you think? Uh, looking at it from the perspective of the folks that have been doing this stuff for a while. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the way I see it is we have a wonderful opportunity. You know, the Department of Commerce is, is uh, newer to the uh, space traffic management um, realm. And so, you know, for quite some time, the, uh, the JSPOC, Joint Space Operations Center, has stated that they want to get away from, you know, managing traffic in space. Okay, they want to, you know, focus more on their military mission, rightfully so. And so, you know, this is a really a great time of opportunity for Department of Commerce to do things like we were mentioning earlier, to integrate new sensors, uh, to really get that owner-operator data, maybe transponder data, and, ex and et cetera. But really, um, you know, set norms and standards to try to say, okay, you know, can we get the data coming in uh, using common formats that everybody can use? <coughs> because right now, it's a little messy, okay? Can we um, then integrate that data such that people's privacy to an extent is protected, you know, but that everybody knows where everybody else is going to be so they can avoid them, avoiding those potential collisions. Great, thank you. So with that, let me open it up. Yeah. Uh, Gordon Ressler, formerly of DARPA. Uh, when Jamie put up this slide, one of the unaddressed areas that he mentioned was non-traditional space activities. And I'll give you an example of, of a non-traditional activity satellite servicing. So a satellite, let's say, with robotics on it goes over to inspect or to repair or upgrade another satellite. Now these are much closer together than the ground-based sensors are going to be able to set meters apart. Um, so it's going to be a small fraction of the number of, of X objects that are up there. This, this business, you know, if, even if there's five or six of those, compare this to the thousands of satellites that are being launched in these new constellations. But it is a space traffic management issue, so I just wanted to hear the panel having any thoughts at all on, on how you would you know, create policies and processes for, for managing these really non-traditional, exciting from a commercial point of view and, and from a defense point of view, but, but difficult and, and odd sorts of, of processes. Well, you outlined a good scenario, and that is one of the areas that, that obviously we're going to be looking at. A couple of a couple of basic observations. Obviously, the company that's doing that is going to have to part of their their program is going to be figuring out how do you manage those two uh, objects in close proximity to each other. So we'll leave that to them. But the important thing for us is obviously, as you think about the policy side, as we get that kind of activity going in space. If I'm the U.S. government and I see an object moving toward another satellite, I might be a little bit concerned, particularly if it happens to be anywhere near an asset that I am. And I think of the guy, you know, Earl sitting next to me, is, is, uh, this is one of his key concerns. So this is where having a forum, having a, a, a government entity that can take that kind of data, be aware of those kind of operations, will deconflict a lot of things. And that's, that's one of the objectives here, is to help facilitate that set, as uh, I think Andrew was mentioning, set up the, the best practices and the other things so that people are communicating about these kinds of activities. Otherwise, these things will never get off the ground. And I would point out, in terms of communicating and collaborating, the DARPA-led effort called CONFERS, that I think I just wanted to 
Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to follow up with that comment. Um, so, you know, the, the thing about RPO is, and as you mentioned, actually, you know, when two objects get very, very close together, it's very difficult to identify which one object is object A and which one is object B. And did you actually get them mixed up as they connected or crossed, right? That's called cross tagging, okay? And so this is where, you know, integrating this unique data really becomes valuable. Because, you know, if we had data coming from the owner operator or for, from my transponder, which gives you unique serial numbers, right, then you couldn't confuse object A for object B. And, and not only does that have a lot of uh, implications for commercial and flight safety, but it also has national security implications. I think both Earl and Andrew highlighted that this is going to drive increasing demands on SSA capabilities in order to, to monitor these. Uh, you file a plan, you've got a policy, but in execution, <laughs> does this vehicle actually follow its plan? And which orbits this is going to cross during during this maneuver? Oh, uh, right now we don't maintain uh, real-time custody, permanent custody of objects in space now. But this, is, this is going to become a huge challenge as we've got things that are, that are doing close operations, doing rendezvous, and not colliding mm -hmm. with the object, and you've got cross-tagging and Andrew mission, so it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to levy a huge challenge to the SSA and the capabilities of SSA. As he mentioned, uh, very few sensors have the capability to distinguish between objects that are, that are very close. Uh, that may be a, a need that we have in order to enable more of these operations. Yeah, and uh, I'll just add, you know, earlier you brought up a really good point earlier that I think applies here. In the maritime domain, people figured out, you know, how do you signal hostile versus non-hostile attack when a, when a boat approached another boat, you know, going back to the days of sail. Uh, but even now, that same analog was taken, you know, when a, when a fighter jet intercepts somebody coming into your airspace, there's a set of protocols that everybody's agreed to. These are the rules of the road. So it, it's a matter of taking those same protocols to the next step. It's not a, it's not as odd a case as people may think. So next question. Um, first of all, I want to say, Earl, about your, your boss, Secretary Ross, um, his enthusiasm for this business is infectious. That could speak to many of us who had the honor of interacting with him. He's become quite a student of the industry, so it's a reflection on you and James back there and the other members of the team. This administration has attempted uh, to privatize air traffic control, so I wonder, uh, and you've heard from Earl and Andrew, the complexity there, a lot of steep learning curve. Any thought to, in terms of public private partnership, what type of governance model this might evolve into over time? Well, that's, I mean, you raise a great point, and that's obviously something we'll be exploring further. I, you know, there, there, I think there will be opportunities for public-private partnerships in this. You know, there are going to be certain core governmental functions that, that people are going to want to keep. I mean, obviously, DOD has, has its role, and um, you know, that's one thing I'd like to say up at, at the get-go, is that they have been fantastic in terms of helping uh, the Department of Commerce understand what's involved here and what, what we need to do. <coughs> so been tremendous in supporting this and like I say, I think it, it just across the government effort is fantastic here. But that we are looking at public private partnerships. We're gonna be I think looking at a number of different models as to how that works. I don't think any decision's been made as to it's gonna be all public private partnership or it's gonna be something else, but that is definitely in the mix. Thank you. I think the evolution is 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 key. It's so it's going to be an evolution and it's going to drive ongoing requirements. As we look at this from an architecture, it's, it's going to drive changes across the architecture to respond. And then, of course, the policy concepts of operations are going to have to adjust uh, as we evolve this process. I think we have a question back there. Thank you. Um, sitting for everyone with Space News, these operations that are being conducted right now, will no longer provide SSA data to commercial and foreign entities after 2024. So does did commerce, is commerce okay with that deadline, assuming that it gets passed into law? Is that something that presumes that you will be ready to take over in six years? Um, what would be involved in that? 
Well, obviously the Trump administration looks forward to doing all six years, so uh, <laughs> that's, that's a timeline that works well with us. Um, you know, obviously the, the, the Congress has uh, a lot of input into these processes, and this is, the you know, legislation is their way of signaling what they'd like to see or not see. Um, you know, I, I don't think from the administration's point of view there's been a hard and fast cut over deadline established, but if that's the direction we get from Congress, obviously we'll, we'll make sure we meet that goal. I just actually wanted to articulate more of an uh, observation uh, more of a question. And it's following on, I think Andrew, you first mentioned the opportunity that we have here to do things smart things. Um, one of the opportunities we have is, and this is going back to a number of examples in different programs, often um, network and cybersecurity is an afterthought to a program instead of architected in from the beginning. So I want to just express that I think that there's an opportunity here to make sure that data <coughs> integrity, network security, and cybersecurity are architected into this effort from the ground up. And I look at risk as um, likelihood versus consequence. And when you have so many more spacecraft or objects, and you have, um, given the importance of the orbital regime, uh, likelihood and consequence both go up. And I'll follow up on that. That's that's clearly another reason why the department is a, is a logical place to look at this role. Is is NIST leads the cybersecurity framework. I think what we uh, would say, you know, Secretary Ross is, is and the administration as a whole are very concerned about cybersecurity. And I think we do have to look uh, carefully at our prior experience. And, and right now, in the Internet of Things, we're seeing that very problem, which is. Uh, there, there may not be a marketplace mechanism that, that encourages the right behavior. And so, you're right, as we build this space architecture, that's going to have to be something that's built in. And if we can establish that as a best practice, and if necessary, as some kind of government standard, um, we, we will definitely look to do that. Because you cannot, uh, we can't find ourselves in a situation where five years from now, ten years from now, we're having uh, spacecraft uh, or objects in space being able to be captured, diverted, otherwise taken places they're not supposed to be, uh, because that would be devastating for the entire operation. Uh, yes. Hi, I'm Mark Nash, and representative Derek Homer's office. Um, as, as was said previously, uh, Chairman, or Secretary Ross has been a very enthusiastic Vice President Pence about commerce taking over this role. Um, as, as my boss is an appropriator, we, are, you know, we always follow the money. And so when we saw the president's budget request and it only asked for 3.6 million and nine FTE for the two offices that are going to be combined into a new space commerce program, it didn't seem to jive as well as we thought it would coming from the conversations we've had previously. Can you help explain that number or what numbers you're looking for maybe as you look towards 2020, um, 2021? Uh, well, it's, I think everybody's aware the, the budgeting process is, is a, an ongoing function of the government. Um, when, we, when we came in, uh, the administration started, we were already partway through a budget cycle, then of course had a continuing resolution. Really the upcoming 20, FY 2020 budget is, I'd say, the first one where the administration is kind of fully in charge throughout developing that. So I think you, you, know, you have parallel tracks going here. You have the Space Council standing up, and starting to coordinate this interagency process. At the time, the FY19 budgets were put together, uh, which would have been last summer. None of this was decided, and uh, so it would have been premature for the department to have put in a request um, more than what we did. We, we did try to pump it up some, but there was not necessarily the agreement within the administration. Now that the Space Council's had a chance to deliberate and review on this and provide clear guidance, for the next budget cycle, you'll see I think, something different. And I might remind you, responding to a question means it's not lobbying, so. Congress is free to lobby however they want. They write the rules. So, uh, <coughs> hi, Josh Baldwin, Secure World Foundation. Um, as we're talking about a more open uh, and comprehensive architecture for SSA and STM, can the panel talk to the challenges of classification on orbit? Or not classification, sorry. Um, Class, classified information on orbit that basically removes some objects from at least spacepack.org currently. Uh, is that going to be a challenge that the administration addresses? 
Uh, well, I mean, I, I think Earl's better suited to talk to the to the classified portion, but you know, obviously, the, the government has a national security interest, and so you know, I think the challenge for any of this is um, as sensors become more proficient and, and better and cheaper, uh, it becomes harder and harder to basically say there's there's not an object there, which was sort of the approach in the past. Um, but that, that being said, there's still going to be assets that, to the extent technology allows us to keep those invisible, they'll remain invisible. Um, but uh, we're going to speak any better to the, to the challenge that's faced on that front. Well, I think the technology is going to drive that. As, as Earl said, uh, you know, if, if everybody can see see an object, uh, then it's, 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 it's pretty clear it's there. Uh, and and uh, it doesn't do you any good to deny that that object is there. Now, you, can, you don't have to provide information about what it's doing and its capabilities and, and those things. So that, of course, could remain classified. But I think there are going to have to be some policy changes as technology moves forward. And we've seen this in any number of disciplines. Uh, throughout the history of, of uh, mankind, uh, technology moves forward and, and it drives a need to change policies and uh, doctrine and, and modes of operation. And, and so I might add uh, the conversations I've had. So for example, State Department has a real concern with launch and early orbit data going into the database because when you think about it, launch and early orbit for satellite launch, nothing classified, nothing concerned about that. Launch and early orbit for a missile test no country is going to want to share, okay, how well did it perform? When did it have main engine cut off? What was the, what was the end velocity? Because now you're violating the missile technology control regime and releasing information that you're not supposed to under an international agreement. So there's a lot of tangled things that go into the conversation. It's not just objects in space that you don't want people to know about. It's also there's other data that has to be protected by international agreement. It's supposed to be protected. So. There's a combination of those things that, that, that all have to be worked into the new policy we're changing. And, and I'll just add to what Ed said. You know, I think that's the, the nice, interesting thing about this time right now is that I think a lot of these uh, various aspects of space were sort of <coughs> in their own individual silos before. And that's really what the Space Council is trying to, to get past is we're now at a point where these individual silos can't continue to operate that way. And so you do need a whole government approach to trying to figure out how do we integrate these things and, and maximize the utility um, so that America can <laughs> uh, Joseph Kohler, now Aerospace Corporation. Uh, you spoke earlier about uh, flag of choice, and um, I would like to see as it pertains to space traffic management or SSA, what are the efforts at Commerce that or Commerce could do in addition to what DMV is already doing to enhance that um, desire to make the United States a flag of choice or to be an industry representative, what do you think could be that additional step that the government should do to make the United States a, a more prominent flag of choice? Well, uh, thank you for the question. It's, uh, I think there are a number of things we can do in addition to providing good space traffic management, space situational awareness. I think one of the one of the benefits of having a central repository for that is that it could become very apparent that if you come and, and flag here in the United States, you'll have access to that system. Uh, we're obviously going to encourage all of our international partners and people flagged elsewhere to continue to provide into that system. So that's going to be one of the challenges. You, you want to maximize the matter of which flag you're at. You want to know where people are. But then on top of that, I think people often overlook the, the liability side of things and the stability of the US courts the stability of operating here, the certainty with which we operate and provide regulations. So I think we're going to look at, at that whole aspect of the, the space regime as people get up there and they're, we heard the prior panel say there will be accidents, well there probably will be. Um, so where do you go to, to get redress? And so the United States provides a great opportunity there. And then also it's, it's the leadership and the thinking. You know, how do we get out there, set standards, and provide this pathway forward? I think tie all those things together, uh, we should be a very attractive place for people to come. And that, that's what we're really seeking to to us here. Now, I, again, from, from a commercial perspective, uh, I believe it becomes a, a business case analysis. And that, that includes uh, many factors uh, when you're considering, considering launch. The regulatory framework, 
the reliability that Earl mentioned, and then of course the cost. And the previous panel uh, identified some of those. Uh, I think Mr. Coleman mentioned the fact that we're trying to streamline the regulatory framework. And uh, Mr. Rodriguez talked about uh, the potential for reducing costs. You know, I think all of those factors and other factors that uh, people will consider, insurance, uh, certainly one of those, uh, will be factored into uh, making a business case uh, analysis concerning where you go for launch. Great. So uh, I'll just open it up for closing remarks. I'll start at the far left and work our way over. Yeah, um, so um, just actually one, one more item on the last question there. Uh, just an example came to mind, the space key. Okay, um, so that was the, uh, the, the satellite, very tiny satellites that were launched recently without a launch license, right? And, um, you know, so we're talking about the flag of choice. So one concern that we have is if we aren't the appropriate flag of choice, what's to stop the company that sponsored these, that created these space keys for moving to a different country, right? And so I'll point out a couple things. Obviously, you know, having a, an appropriate level of regulations, but not being too onerous. But the other thing that people often overlook is having clarity of regulation and just having, you know, certainty that, okay, if I go apply for a launch license, I'm probably gonna get it, right? And the thing that actually uh, prevented Space B from, uh, you know, getting a launch license was no one was convinced at FCC that they could be tracked. Okay, and so if you could get some type of little transponder, <laughs> take care of you. <laughs> Those are my concluding remarks. <laughs> Great, again, I want to thank, thank you for having me here today, and thank uh, all of you for uh, bearing with us as uh, we talk through these two panels. Um, I just reemphasize the fact that uh, this is an exciting time. We talked about uh, a lot of launches in the first panel. We talked about multiple platforms uh, going up on a single launch. Uh, Andrew mentioned the fact that uh, some of the launches, uh, a high percentage of, of the vehicles never, never turn on. All of these are going to create challenges for space situational awareness and for space traffic management. Uh, and again, I think we need an architectural perspective to address these challenges, and uh, it's going to be an evolutionary process as technology progresses. And I just uh, in a second, thank, thank you very much for having us on this panel. And I, I wanted to take a moment to recognize my colleague, James Uthmeyer, back here. And just to give you an example of how the Secretary approaches this and, and how this benefits, James is also the Department's Regulatory Reform Officer. So, uh, you know, he has helped push through a lot of the regulatory streamlining at the Department in a number of different fronts. And that's exactly the kind of approach you know, that we're going to take. Uh, there was a recent incident uh, where in the uh, Falcon Heavy launch, they, they put a nice shiny red object up there in space, and it had some cameras on it, and people suddenly discovered, whoa, wait a minute, this is a potential violation of the uh, Remote Sensing Act. So uh, with James really leading the charge, we were able to get the department reorganized to focus on how do we get the next set of launches, which were coming up in a matter of weeks, cleared and authorized, and I'm, I'm happy to report we were successful in doing that. We had a great team down in the remote sensing office who stood right up and focused on this, got the job done, uh, but it was a great example of how with sort of this new leadership, they could really turn things around and change the, the ambit, and so that's what we're really trying to provide at the secretarial <coughs> level. That's what the whole elevation of the department's <coughs> space assets up to the secretary's level is designed to do is really send that message that there's a new approach to all this, the idea is to facilitate and make this a, an easy process for industry to come in and continue to do this while we continue to protect the core government functions that need to be done. Thank you very much for having me. All right, and thank you very much. Uh, I think that did a great job of summing up the entire panel, so I'll leave it at that. My uh, thanks again to everybody for joining us. A final reminder, there are uh, reports if you'd like to get them on your way out. There may be a handful of sandwiches left if any of our uh, staff friends want to snag some for how many? Uh, hey, yeah, we have a handful left. If anyone wants to grab them for your office mates on the way out, they will uh, we would like them to be. Uh, thank you all for coming. My, one final ask, if anyone 
have suggestions for other technology and policy areas where you feel follow-on events would be helpful, feel free to grab me or any of the uh, CSBS staff and we will uh, add, try to add those to our agenda. We're looking to answer the questions that are most relevant to those involved. Have a great rest of the day.